All right, so I'm going to give part two of my talk, which is shorter than part one. Uh, after that, we will have some clinical reporting exercises, uh, which will include looking at an actual clinical report. Um, and uh, you may be disappointed or relieved to know that these exercises will not involve Docker. Ah, uh, yes, many sad faces. But but seriously, everyone, I I am I am really impressed and proud of how well everyone has done with Docker today and yesterday, because I know it's a real challenge if you've never met the command line or Unix or any of those things before. Um, so before I go on with my presentation, I just like to say, uh, so there are details in all the course materials for feedback. This is the first time we've run this course, so it's very much a work in progress. And we would love to have honest feedback from you on things you found difficult or ways we can improve or things you, that you'd like us to do. So I encourage you all to give us lots of feedback, be as honest as you like, we can take it, and this will enable us to improve for the next time. Okay? Okay, great. All right, so part two of my talk on clinical reporting. All right, so thus far, I've just been kind of setting the scene, explaining all the infrastructure. You know, in, in much like an iceberg, there's an awful lot going on underneath the surface. Uh, but we're now getting to the actual clinical report document itself and how that is made. Okay, so here I am. I'm going to take you on a deep dive, not like really deep, you won't need special breathing equipment, but fairly deep dive into clinical sequencing. So I'm going to talk about, or clinical reporting even. So I'm going to talk about just an outline of the reporting process by which we make these reports and sign them off and get them into the clinic. Uh, I'll talk in more detail about the structure of a report and, as an ex and how we make the actual report itself. And so as I've said, we have three different assays, each with their own style of clinical report and content. But just for the sake of simplicity here, I'm going to be concentrating on the whole genome and transcriptome sequencing report, which is our most comprehensive and I think the most numerous one that we do. Okay, so clinical reporting process. Some of it is automated, some of it is not. So it starts off heavily automated. It's done by machines. We have all these analysis pipelines that you've heard about, and we have the Gerba reporting software. So we run that just with the standard settings to produce a draft report to give us an idea of what variants the pipelines have found. So we then review those variants, we make sure they're real, uh, we write our interpretation, and all that is a human-driven process. So there's um, three or four of us in uh, clinical genome interpretation who do this. We discuss each case amongst ourselves. We make a report. We send that report to a clinical geneticist who, as I've said, is a medical doctor who signs off on it. And the report then finally is given to the requisitioner, who is the person who originally, you know, sent us the, uh, the tissue sample, and they use it to inform their decisions of clinical treatment. All right, so structure of the report. I've kind of touched on this already. I'm now going to go into a little bit more detail. So we have the lucky number of 13 sections. Um, of this fairly comprehensive report. And I'll just very quickly explain to you what each one is for. The, the, the uh, titles should be pretty indicative, but just a little bit more detail on these. Okay, so we start off with patient and physician. This is where personal health information goes. Uh, patient name, patient date of birth, name of referring physician, all that stuff. I do not see it. I don't want to see it. I don't need to know it. Uh, it gets filled in by the clinical geneticist who is cleared to handle this information as a final step before it is sent back into the clinic. So part two, case overview. This has like internal anonymized sample IDs. It has things like the cancer type and other general information. So the next thing we have is uh, the actual variants we found. This is kind of the meat of the report, if you like. So we have uh, treatment options as identified by OncoKB. We have a result summary written by the interpreter. And then sections five through nine go into detail on the individual oncogenic variants we found. 
So there are some genome-wide metrics like tumor mutation burden, purity and ploidy, things like that. Um, and for SNVs, for instance, we'll have a brief summary to say we found, you know, 108 SNVs, but we will go into detail on the ones that are identified as oncogenic by OncoKB and provide much more information on them, which typically is between maybe, uh, sometimes we don't find any, usually we find something. So it's between like one or two and up to about maybe a dozen or so variants where we give that greater level of detail. So then the third major part of the report is explanations, description, disclaimers. So we have an assay description, which includes the versions of all the software tools used to generate the report. Again, that's important for like auditing and uh, tracking and reproducibility. Uh, we have a disclaimer, which it describes our assays and mentions things like limited detection thresholds. Uh, we have the report sign-offs, so it identifies which clinical genome interpreter and which clinical geneticist signed off the report and when. And finally, we have an appendix which contains some definitions and some reference material. And also a lot of this stuff is hyperlinked. So uh, the report PDF contains links to OncoKB and other uh, reference sources. Okay, so now we're getting at last to how a clinical report is made. So as I've said, we need a system for doing this. Everything we do for OICR clinical assays has a system that's documented and uh, you know well organized and well understood. So in the uh, in the early days of research bioinformatics and to some extent still in research labs, it's okay to just go out there and do stuff and just oh you need to do a thing. Let's write a, a quick uh, Python script that does the thing. Uh, and that's fine until you're doing 50 different things and your scripts all need to talk to each other. And if you're not careful about it, then it will do what this cartoon does and everything will come crashing down. And it will certainly not be reliable and robust enough for a production clinical lab. So we do not do this. Instead, we apply the methods of software engineering. We have a well-tested, well-understood, reliable version controlled pipeline. And that applies to the clinical reporting software, Gerba, just the same as anything else. So the Gerba reporting software is named after an island. Instead of food or gods in CGI, we have islands. Uh, so it's an island off the coast of North Africa. The initial D is silent. Um, and uh, yeah, so it has a modular structure, which is based on plugins. So uh, I've explained how, you know, all of our assays are rapidly advancing and changing and we're trying to improve them and we're adding new metrics and we're swapping out new to um, software tools. So we changed uh, Sequenza for purple for our CNV estimation. Uh, when we came to do that in Gerba, it was a matter of replacing a plugin, which is much, much easier than having some like spaghetti tangle of interconnected software where, you know, you change one thing and it means you have to change 30 other things. So you know, Gerba is designed to be modular and easily upgradable. So when it comes to running Gerba, we provide it with a configuration file to generate a report. Uh, so the config file is in INI format, which is a fairly standard kind of plain text config format. Uh, Gerba does its thing and Gerba produces a machine readable JSON file. So um, this could be automatically read in by software and uh, queried and summarized and things like that. We haven't had time to do as much of that as we'd like, but it is a resource we can use if we want to like process reports in a different way or cross compare them, stuff like that. Uh, and the other output, the one that the clinicians actually see is this human readable PDF. So Gerba has documentation on read the docs with the link right there and the um, software is open source and available on GitHub. Okay, so the INI config file looks roughly like this. This is a greatly simplified version, but not that much simplified. So we put in like maybe 10 or so parameters by hand and the rest are automatically configured and we don't need to worry about them. So the INI format has section headers in square brackets followed by key value pairs. So there's the name of the parameter and then an equal sign and then the value. 
So we have core parameters, which control kind of the, the main central operations of Gerba. So that includes things like a report ID and an author name. And then we have the individual plugins. So here we have the CNV purple plugin, which has some input from a zip file, and it needs to know the Oncotree code, which is a means of identifying the cancer type for um, OncoKB. So we give it that. And very similar for the SMV in Dell. It gets a math file, um, which is, uh, um, I forget what math stands for, but it's a, it's another variant uh, file format. And again, it needs to know the Onca tree code. So this is what we do. We put this into a plain text file, and then we run an application on the command line, as you've all been becoming familiar with. So this is the command to generate a, a Gerber report. It's nice and simple. Um, so gerba.py report minus i config file minus o report directory and then minus minus pdf to make pdf. That's it. Uh, gerba does have many other capabilities. So if you were to run the help function, you would see that. Um, so I, I'm certainly not going to go through all this in detail, but you can run various steps of gerba in isolation. You can update re existing reports. You can do a bunch of stuff with it. But the you know, 95% of the time we are just using the report command to make reports. All right, so getting back to purity and ploidy for a moment. So I have a little exercise here that we can, you can uh, discuss at, at each table for a few minutes. So I have here a stack of reads similar to the ones Larry was showing you earlier in the day. Um, and so reads end at various points, of course. So they they have different positioning um, in the stack. You have a kind of ragged edge of the reads. These are much shorter than normal paired end reads, of course. They're like 20 or so bases instead of 150, but you you know they serve for the purposes of illustration. And there are a few discrepancies. You can see there's a, a one um, G changed to a C and a couple of A's changed to G's. But the thing that interests us here is there's a stack of four red A's. Okay, so what we're imagine what we're looking at here. This is a mix of tumor and normal tissue because, as I've said, you know, samples are never entirely made up of tumor tissue. Uh, so we have some tumor DNA, we have some normal DNA mixed in unknown proportions, and we do not know the copy number state of the tumor DNA. So it could be diploid. It might not be. There might be loss of heterozygosity at this mutation or this entire section of the tumor genome might be four ploid. It might be eight ploid, okay? So just, just not very long, but just take a minute or so and discuss amongst yourselves which one of these solutions you think is the correct one based on what you see here, okay? Okay, I think that's long enough. Uh, this is just a quick kind of exercise for illustration. All right, so let's, let's quickly have a show of hands. Who thinks the right answer is number one? Anyone? No? Number two? Uh, a couple of twos. Number three? Yeah, we got some threes. Four? A lot of fours, okay. Five? Yeah, a couple of fives. Who thinks it's number six? Yeah, yeah, maybe number six. Okay, I've I've been a little bit tricky here. Number six is, in fact, the correct answer. All right, we, we, because we do not have enough information, any one of these could be correct or something else. Yeah, um, you know, purity, is it purity 50%? Is it purity 53%? We have no way of distinguishing based on this because as I've said, the number of reads you get at any location is random. Yeah, so we have 15 reads here, but we could just as easily have 20 or we could have 10. Yeah, so this is the outcome of a random stochastic process. And all we know is we have some varied mix. Okay, so we have some unknown proportion of tumor and normal DNA. And the tumor DNA itself has some unknown copy state. And based on just one mutation, it is completely impossible to tell what the purity and ploidy status is. The most, I mean, all of these that I've written down here, I haven't been completely unkind. All of these are kind of somewhat plausible options. The ploidy 8 one less so because ploidy 8 is just biologically unlikely, but it, it can happen. 
Um, so, okay. So how, how do we actually solve this problem? It is a really, really difficult computational problem. It's another one of these things that you cannot do by hand, except for like toy examples such as this one. So um, the, the purple tool has a rather complicated algorithm that looks at the entire genome and tries to split it into segments and infer copy number state for entire segments based on hundreds or thousands of mutations that it identifies. And so purple does this and it provides us with a summary of its findings. And that is what we look, what we look at to try and determine purity ploidy status. And sometimes it's extremely clear and straightforward, sometimes not. And it requires a fair bit of human judgment. Okay, so as I've said, this is a hard computational problem. There are many problems like this in bioinformatics. This one is not so well known, but it's definitely up there in terms of difficulty. Okay, so the output from uh, purple looks something like this. So on the left-hand side, I've, I've described this before, you have a heat map plot of purity ploidy solutions. Uh, high probability regions are colored dark blue. Um, low probability regions are lighter blue. Very low probability is white. Uh, the thing on the right-hand side is kind of some more detail of what the purple solution looks like. So the upper part, this thing with this kind of grid of orange um, squares. So the black, the black spots on that plot are segments of the genome. So each segment has an estimated uh, purity and ploidy, and it averages those to get uh, um, figures for the entire genome. So... What we want to, so the, the sort of bright red regions of that plot are regions of high probability. So we can see here all the kind of black dots are mostly in red regions. That's good. That means they're mostly in high probability regions. So if um, purple is not very well able to estimate what's going on, and you'll see examples of this later, then there may be lots and lots of segments that are not in the high probability regions. They're scattered widely all over the place. And the segments are also quite well clustered together. So this, this genome is, um, uh, it's got some copy number loss, but it's, you know, you tend to have an integer number of uh, tumor normal uh, copies, which is, you know, a good thing to have. And so the, uh, the lower plot so I was talking about the difference between loss of heterozygosity and like genome-wide duplication events. So purple also has to try and infer the distinction between these. So you can see there's kind of a diagonal line. So this is plotting the penalty factor that purple applies. Um, so, okay, so you have a segment of the genome. So maybe this is a seg, and it has some things that look like mutations with loss of heterozygosity. So maybe by sheer coincidence, you have a whole lot of mutations, each one of which has lost heterozygosity. But that's kind of, you know, the more times you see that, the less plausible it becomes. And it becomes more likely there's some kind of segment-wide duplication event. So uh, if segments appear above that diagonal line, then purple has decided, no, no, this isn't segment-wide duplication. This is just lots and lots of little events. If they appear below that line, then it's more a segment-wide duplication event. So pretty much all of these are below the line. And again, this indicates it's a fairly well-behaved solution. Um, so it's not terrific um, because you can see, on, in particular on the left-hand plot, there's a lot of kind of blobs of dark blue scattered around at varying different values of purity and ploidy. And, you know, the solution it's arrived at, okay, fine, it's like, can't quite read from here, 76% purity, that's not bad. But you can see there's like a, a wide vertical stripe where it's chosen its solution. And pretty much everything in that stripe is diploid, but there's a very wide range of purities from 40% up to 100 and, you know, is purity 40%? Is it 100%? That's a pretty significant difference. Um, but purple just kind of makes the best guess it can and delivers that to us as its uh, primary solution. 
but purple does also offer alternate solutions. And sometimes if the primary solution looks particularly, you know, unhelpful, we can go to the alternates and choose one of them and use that for our report instead. Oops. Okay, yes, question. Sorry? Mm -hmm. Are you looking at the exercises? Okay, this this plot, I don't think it appears in the exercises. Uh, um, we'll, we'll, we'll get to the exercises later, don't worry. Yeah. Okay, but to, to kind of speak to your question for this sample, this is a pretty well-behaved plot and we went with the default solution. Eh. Okay, so the, like the general principle when we're looking at these purity polity plots and trying to interpret them is we like to have orderly solutions. We'd like to have solutions with low entropy. Uh, I mean, it's okay if it's not perfectly accurate, but we want it to be precise. So if purple has a sort of fairly well concentrated blob of dark blue, and it says, you know, the I'm, I'm very sure that it's like diploid with purity, you know, somewhere around 75%, give or take a couple of percent, you know, that's good. That's what we want. If the solution is kind of smooshed all over the place and you have high probability regions everywhere, that's kind of the same as having high probability regions nowhere. Yeah. So if it has an incredibly wide range of values, that's no solution at all. And in circumstances like that, we may have to fill the sample. Okay, so I've talked quite a lot about purity and ploidy. We do other kinds of review also. So you heard from Larry earlier about looking at variants in IGV. And we do this for all the oncogenic variants identified in the report. So I won't belabor this too much because you've all had a good look at IGV. But here we have, for instance, a very clear instance of a C to T mutation. So on the top is the tumor genome, on the bottom is the normal genome, and it's a clear mutation. It's good, so we don't have to worry about anything. We can include it in the report. All right, and let's see. Yeah, so we also look at structural variants and fusions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about these. Um, and uh, we look at those in IGV as well. But first, just to give you a feel for what these are, I'm, going, I'm showing you some output from a program called Ariba, which is part of our data analysis pipeline. So what happens in a fusion is a chunk of one gene and a chunk of another one, which may be quite widely separated, they may be on completely different chromosomes, get fused together in the, um, in the tumor genome. And you have a new, effectively a new functional gene made up of these two uh, pieces of these two normal genes. And this new functional gene may be making a protein of some kind. It may have some kind of regulatory function. Some fusions are actionable and predict sensitivity to certain drugs. So, you know, fusions are, are worth studying. But, you know, this is a fairly complex event. So you've, you've been looking at stacks of reads and identifying um, single nucleotide variants. That's, you know, it still has its challenges, but it's fairly straightforward compared to identifying a fusion. But we do still attempt to um, identify them and, and work with them. So here you have a uh, fusion between two genes on chromosome 11. So you've got the blue gene on the right, you've got the red gene on the left. The red gene has actually been flipped in orientation and these have made this new gene, which is doing something we don't necessarily know what in the tumor genome. Okay, so a little more stuff from Ariba. So on the left there, you have a circle plot uh, which highlights this particular gene fusion event. So these genes are quite near neighbors. They're both on chromosome 11. But you can see here in the circle plot, there are lines connecting very widely separated regions of the genome. So tumor genes, tumor genomes are just astonishingly mutated sometimes. Sometimes they're fairly quiet, but often there's like vast structural rearrangements, like, you know, Sometimes half, the, literally half of the human genome is missing altogether. And we don't really know how they continue, how these tumor cells continue to survive at all, let alone reproduce at a rapid rate, yet they do. So, you know, there's a lot of science to be done here and things we don't yet understand. But um, 
So in the fusions in our reports, you've got this circle plot. In the middle, you've got uh, a plot of the protein domains. It says, you know, retained protein domains. So this is, you know, functionally coding something. And on the right, you have the supporting read count. So you've got like nine or 10 supporting reads in each fusion, which is good. That's more evidence. This is a genuine fusion. Okay, and we also come to look in IGV. So this is a split screen view in IGV. This is one of the cool things you can do. So on the left hand side, it's one gene on the right hand side, it's the other. And um, but as far as the genome of this tumor is concerned, you know, these regions are not separated, these have been smooshed together. So Lots and lots of reads will fall across that breakpoint. The breakpoint is not a real thing in the tumor genome. It's an imaginary thing that we use to try and make sense of what's going on. Yeah, the separation is real in a healthy genome. In a healthy genome, these two genes are separated by millions of base pairs. Uh, but in the tumor genome, they're not separated at all. It becomes this one new thing. So sequencing reads cross over that breakpoint in our reference. And you can see here, there's a whole lot of reads on the left in right, light gray, and those reads continue on the right in dark gray. So lots and lots of reads across the boundary, again, is evidence that this is a real uh, fusion. Okay, so having reviewed all these variants, we then come to write an interpretative statement. It's one paragraph, it's like 200, 200 300 words, something like that, just to summarize the salient points of the report. Uh, and I'm intentionally not showing you one because writing one of these is going to be part of the exercises later on. Okay, so you can have a go at that. All right, so now finally, having done all this, having done our QC, having written our report, we now need to upload it to the system to get it into the, uh, the next step of the process, which is sign off by the clinical geneticist. So we do this using the dim sum system, which I mentioned earlier. So you can see there, we click a link and we get a little pop-up dialog box. And um, so, you know, as I'm doing this, I'm logged into dim sum, it knows who I am. I click approved and it puts my name into the database as having approved this report at this time. And then it emails the clinical geneticists to take up the next step. All right, so this uh, concludes part two of my talk. So just to sum up, so we have these 13 sections in the WGTS report, which cover quite thoroughly all the stuff we found from whole genome and transcriptome sequencing, although we are looking to add more. Um, so the sections are generated by plugins in the Gerba software. We don't have exactly 13 plugins. It's not quite a a one-to-one -one relationship, but it's it's on that order. We have 20 or so plugins that go into a, uh, a report. Uh, and then it goes into the human review, human judgment of the clinical genome interpreters. So we configure the report, we review a draft report for QC purposes, uh, we write our statement, and then we upload and sign off. Okay, so that concludes part two. Are there any questions?